Hello, Sooner Nation. OU Insider, subscribers, coach, Brian Clinton enthusiasts, the man of many hats. People who think OU softball should just throw in the towel, demolish the stadium, disband the program. This isn't the podcast for you. This is not the one. If this is what you're looking for, we're looking for more level-headed, calm-headed takes here on the latest episode of the Oklahoma Drill, a podcast fueled by OU Insider and the Rivals Network. I am Jesse Crittenden, joined as always by Brian Clinton. Brian, did you like? Did you like what I did just then? Usually, I say this is the podcast for you. I didn't yeah, do that this time. I like that. That was good. That did was I good. get you? Yeah. It it's got to be. Uh... You got to listen to Bob Marley and it, like, it's chill. Like this is just, this is a chill podcast. Yeah. Everything's okay. No emotion. Don't worry. Be happy. Mm. Uh, That's a know, good song. The thunder are okay. They're not great. They're just okay. No. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Dude. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah. It is good stuff. Thunder up one Oh, I was at the game last night. We're going to try to go to the game tomorrow night after OU softball plays either the winner of Houston Kansas and Kansas uh, Thursday at 1.30 uh, in Oklahoma City. And, Brian, we think – we talked about it, you know, football, a lot of stuff. There's some recruiting stuff, but for the most part, we're in the offseason. Basketball's in the offseason. This is the time to talk about softball for a lot of different reasons. For one, the regular mm-hmm. season's over. And yeah. two – uh, the, the feeling around OU softball is a little different this t- going into the postseason than it has been. And a big reason for that is that they lost a series against Oklahoma state to end the regular season, six, three to a six, three loss in game one, a six, two loss in game two, before they bounce back to win eight to two on Sunday. But, uh, Brian, you and I, um, were there for the weekend. I, <clears throat> I still don't really know exactly how to process the weekend. I I think in some ways in a general statement before I kick to you, I think in some ways they got exposed the same ways that Texas exposed them. The the weaknesses by Oklahoma standard, they got exposed a little bit. And I also think, Oh, you didn't play particularly well. And I also thought Oklahoma state was just a better team over the weekend, but it's rare to see for one, Oklahoma never loses big 12 series at home. That's number one, two, Mm. they almost never lose series to Oklahoma state and three, they never have weekends or they haven't the last four years. They haven't had weekends where they don't look like the better team. So I'll kick to you fans. Believe me, I heard it. I know you've heard it. I've had people reach out to me individually, like personally asking me what's up with this team. What's going on? I'll kick to you. What what was your impression of the weekend and how how concerning how concerning is it? So to me it was it, it, it sounds funny cuz there's three games in a series obviously but it there were it was a tale of two halves kind of like it's kind of what it felt like. The first two games it felt like a continuation. Like it was the exact same game and we said that when they lost two games to Texas, what that tells me is those two teams are good enough to have a formula to beat Oklahoma. They have a formula. Texas beat Oklahoma two to one twice. Oklahoma state beat Oklahoma six to three and then six to two. Um, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think there is a, there, there's a formula there. The thing that, that, gives me I I guess there's still people out there that feel that Oklahoma is the team to beat me being one of those. And and what I think lends credence to that is there is no team in softball that has more talent on their roster than Oklahoma still at this point. Like there's, there's just not that nine first or nine big, all big 12 players, five first team, four second team, all big 12 players. Um, I mean, these are the same girls that have won all American after all American after all American award. I mean, like we're talking about still the most talented team in softball. What I didn't understand was 
for the first time, it felt like Oklahoma was not the hungrier team. And that goes back to, to against Texas as well. Like those two series, it's almost as if those programs, which this is what happens whenever like, like the Alabama standard in football it's so true. It carries over in softball too. the Alabama standard in football, what the sec became in football in the 17 years that Nick Saban was there was a product of everybody having to play up to Alabama standard. That's, that's how this works. Oklahoma for the same token and softball has set the standard, not just in the big 12, but in college softball and everybody else is playing that stand that's that, that standard. If Oklahoma is doing that, Texas is going to be doing that. Oklahoma State's going to be doing that. Those are their biggest rivals. I don't think it's a coincidence that those two teams are, are some of the best in the country. Um, what you saw over the weekend really was just a – it was a product of a really good team that is hungrier or was hungrier. And, uh, you know, we've kind of said it in passing – that Oklahoma has its back up against the wall and, and didn't really feel that way. But until Sunday, it really didn't feel that way. On Sunday, it was like, okay, this team literally is facing a potential sweep. If they lose this game, they'll be the third seed. And you're talking about potentially falling out of being able to host through Super Regionals. If they were to get have gotten swept and lost in the semifinals in the in the Big 12 tournament this weekend. I don't think they would have uh been an 8 seed or higher. I just don't. It's such a deep field. You can't end the season that way. So, um long story short, I think that this is still a really good team. Over the weekend we saw that there's a formula and Oklahoma had kind of lost its hunger a little bit. They feel like they got it back on Sunday. That's yet to be seen for sure, but we'll find out a lot about that uh, tomorrow on Friday. I'll say this, and I think, I mean, every sport is different. Every team is different, but there's a, like, I always push back a little bit on the idea that, like, for instance, like if Michael Jordan hadn't retired after the mm -hmm. first three-peat, that the Bulls would have won eight titles. I, I just don't agree with that. I really don't. Um, For one, like, there's a reason, like, I think... Not that not that teams always run their course, but it is so hard to win every single year to 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 be at your best every single game, every single year, all the time. And Patty Gasso yeah. has talked about that a lot. The pressure that comes with having to play at your best every single. I mean, there's a like whether it's injuries, whether it's just dynamics within the team changing, because you can bring the same team back from one year to the next. And that doesn't mean it's the same team. Dynamics change. Right coaching changes strategies change the the talent around like at different teams can change and mm -hmm. get better it's just there's so many reasons i will say this was the first weekend since i've started covering ou softball which is this is year three for me that i never thought once oklahoma state went on their runs this was the first time i ever thought oklahoma's not going to win this game they're yeah. not going to rally they're not going to win. Oklahoma State has seized control and they're going to win those first two games. And I've never, ever felt that way. Right. I've never felt OU is out of a game. I've never felt, oh, they, they're not going to rally. It was a little weird to see that. I will say that. Yeah. So um, I, I, and I do think OU has always not only had the talent advantage, like you said, but I think OU has always had the mentality yes. advantage. They've always had both, and that's why they've won three championships in a row. Not to mention, yeah. obviously, coaching advantages and strategy sure. and all that stuff. But, like, they – OU is not a cute uh, finesse doing things smooth. Like, they want to step on your throat. That's what OU softball wants to do. And it was yeah. so weird to kind of see them not collapse, but to take a punch and not give one back and to mm -hmm. also feel like they're not going to give a punch back. Yeah. And I think that's a credit to Oklahoma State. Before we dive into off offensively and defensively, that's just a credit to Oklahoma State, man. It just is. I would not be surprised at all. A at all. I Actually, I would be surprised if Oklahoma State, Texas, and Oklahoma weren't three of the four teams standing at the end of the year in the semifinals to go to the championship series. Uh, those Both of those teams that beat Oklahoma, extremely well-built softball teams, like yeah. top to bottom. Uh, Texas 
you don't outscore Texas Tech 50 to 7 in a weekend series without being absolutely incredible. That's a good softball team. Um, and I want to ask you this before we move any further. And I didn't warn you that this is coming uh, pre show because I, I, want, I want your honest, raw opinion. Are we seeing the effects? And this is this was my my take. Are we seeing the effects of Grace Lyons not being the backbone off the field of this team right now as things have gotten tough throughout the year? You used to hear that she was the mom. That was who took care of everybody in the locker room. Is the struggle or the mentality edge that we have seen Oklahoma kind of lose, is that a byproduct of Grace Lyons not being in the locker room? I'll I'll be honest. Um and I, I want to be careful about what I say. Um because none, none of it is stuff that I would feel not concrete to report on, but it's not stuff that I would put sure. officially out there. Yeah. There have certainly been rumblings. And when I say rumblings, I mean, in the distinct corners of softball is not a team for leaks. That's, that's for one. Oh, you softball is not a team that right. leaks. Right. That's one. And two, they keep things really, really close to the vest. They're really yeah. good at how their image and how they present themselves. And I think for good reason, yes, I think that has definitely been, um, in terms of the, the energy, the mojo of the team, Grace Lyons did a lot. She just did a lot. I think to keep that team, that's not, you have to, you have to have a lot of individuals to come together to have the mojo that OU has had, but it really, yes. it comes from having cohesive leadership. Right. And this isn't a knock on, um, on Kinsey Hansen and Tiari Jennings, who are the team captains for this year. It's that's not a knock on them. I think Gr right. Gr Grace Lyons as great of a shortstop as she was, I think her best attribute was leading that team and get and injecting that team, like almost taking all the individual personalities together and turning them into a cohesive unit that just yes. ran through all of softball. Agreed. And I think, th and I think there have been times and I think there have been rumblings that not only the dynamics aren't the same, which again, for one makes it to where, even if you bring a lot of the same team back, it doesn't mean it's the same team that the dynamics haven't been the same. And I think you've seen, Again, OU's 46 and six. This isn't like they've lost a bunch of games. Right. But in the moments where they've struggled, I think you've seen them try to muster that same intensity, but it just hasn't, in the moments they've struggled, just hasn't been there the same. Right. And I do think that has been, it's not as simple as just you're a senior, you've played a lot of softball, therefore you're the leader. That's not how leadership works. No. It just isn't. So, while I don't think it's something, oh, you can't overcome, and I don't think that Kinsey Hansen and Tiari Jennings aren't good leaders, I do think they miss Grace Lyons' impact in more reasons or in more ways than one, is what I would say. I agree. And, and you know, Tiari's been excellent at, at shortstop. Like, I'm not taking yeah. anything away from what she's done on the field. I just, I, I think that intangible that doesn't get talked about quite enough, um, the leadership in the locker room and knowing who to turn to when things get tough, that's, that's an undervalued part of, of what's going on. I mean, that's, that's why your best college football teams, your best softball team, they, they all, your best basketball teams, they all have a guy or a girl that they turn to. They know if things get rough, they're going to lead us through this. And I think, Oh, you may still be trying to, figure out that dynamic as they get closer to the postseason, And they'll, I, I do think, I think Kenzie Hansen has the ability to be that person for them when things get tough. She has, and I, I, I'm not taking anything away from the girls that are on the team. I just thought that girl was way, uh, far and above anything that we have seen from a leadership perspective in the past from Oklahoma, the way that Grace Lyons went about things and I think that these girls are still trying to find their way uh, w without her as we enter the, the postseason. I agree. And here's the thing. Here's what I'll say, too. Oklahoma's offense until the sixth inning of Sunday, mm -hmm. Oklahoma State had OU's offense straight up rattled. They just, yep. they just did. And I think it was – and I think OU knew they were rattled. I think that was the other thing is Oklahoma State rattled them and OU knew they were rattled. And you have to give Kenny Gajewski credit 
for how he managed the pitching staff. It was pretty damn risky on Friday to not throw Lexi Kilfoyle from the jump. That was pretty risky. It worked out beautifully. <laughs> That's right. the risk. It was a high risk, high reward strategy to not throw Lu- Lexi Kilfoyle, which their whole pitching staff played really well mm-hmm. um, the whole weekend. But for OSU to not only not only survive, but be in the game, those first few innings of Friday before Lexi Kilfoyle came in, and then the same thing on Saturday, you can you can main t- you can be competitive then bring in your ace. It had OU it had OU rattled and I will say it's so weird they didn't have a home run until late Sunday. Mm-hmm. And I will say it was so weird to see OU's lack of aggressiveness and I think they looked confused at times. Yes. And one thing that I wondered and I've said this a couple of times here uh they are walking more they have a higher walk rate this year than they've had in a really long time. They lead college softball or D1 in walks as a team. They lead the country in walks. And while I think that's a good thing and to be able to and at times and to be able to have patience, mm-hmm. I do it seems like OU sometimes when they're facing a really good pitching staff like Oklahoma State, it seems like they're kind of getting caught in between. They're not swinging when they should swing they're swinging when they shouldn't swing it feels like they're they're trying to figure out where's the patience to get a walk so therefore we can get on base and start the domino like Mm -hmm. it was it was rare to see OU's offense so off kilter for one until late on Sunday and two when you look at OU's pitching staff outside I mean Kelly Maxwell I think this was just a tough it was just a tough weekend for her it, it wasn't as dominant as she's been this year. And I think for a lot of reasons, it was an emotional weekend. Patty Gasso talked about that. And two, Oklahoma State looked ready for her. Yep. Uh, Nicole There's May. Not anybody in the country that's going to be more prepared for Kelly Maxwell than the team she just faced. Exactly. And two, I, I'm not going to read that much into that. I'm just not. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's smoke and mirrors, but I'm not going to put that much stock into it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Nicole May was good until Oklahoma State got comfortable with her on Saturday. The thing that is interesting, there's two players we need to talk about in the first and this pitching staff. And the first one is Kirsten Deal, who has been excellent all year and has one of the best ERAs in the country and has been splendid as a sophomore, but for some reason struggles as a relief pitcher. I mean, she just. She was unplayable. She was unplayable. Yeah. And that's not just this weekend. Heading Entering the weekend, she had a 4.85 ERA as a relief pitcher this year out of the pen. Wow. Compare Stats that. Info. Yeah, wow. that's me. That's a good, that's a good one, man. <laughs> um, and then this weekend, not only did she struggle really bad on, sat- or on Saturday, but on Sunday, Carly Keeney, who we'll talk about in a second, pitches a phenomenal game through six innings. Mm -hmm. Then they bring in Kirsten deal and in 0.1 innings, (laughs) she gives up three hits and two runs to the point where they had to bring Carly Keeney back. (laughs) Right. (laughs) They just took her out. They had to bring her back. And I do think that is an interesting wrinkle in the sense that I think that's another thing that OU has to take into account as they go into the postseason. That Kirsten Deal is a good pitcher and they're going to need her, but I don't think you can bring her. And I and I'm not a softball expert. I'm not a baseball expert. I don't know how different it is to come out of the pen versus being the starter, but it's clear. And Patty Gasso even kind of talked about it that for whatever reason, it's just a different thing for her. And I do actually think it's an we have enough of a sample size to say yes. I think that's something OU has to monitor during the postseason. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's. Um, I don't. And you're right. I don't know what it is. I I don't know if it's a. I don't know if she's mentally if she's throwing different than she. I I don't know. I I don't know if it's that she, you know, maybe everybody is settling into the game at the beginning and. She when until she settles in, maybe she's not as effective as she wants to be. But man, it was it like you could feel it in the in the stadium, um, just sitting out there uh, amongst everybody videoing. 
like there was this instant um, anxiety, like after the first hit was given up, like instant anxiety. Because Oklahoma had played pretty well up to that point in, in game three. Yeah. And um, by the time the third hit, I mean, there's people yelling and screaming, get her out of there, you know, get somebody else back in there. And, and when Keeney came back in, you know, she came in with bases loaded, uh, I think one out or no, no outs, no outs. Right. And ends up getting out of the jam after giving up two runs on a hit, but she figures out a way of getting out of it. And, and they, they salvage and end up winning the game. It was just a tough spot because you and I both know we've watched enough Kirsten Deal to know she is an elite. She's pitcher, fantastic, but it's not out of the bullpen. Like I, I, I don't know. That's it's going to be interesting because I think, and this might be your your segue. Uh, well, I think you have some things to tell the people first, but uh, we've got some. Uh, we've got a lot to take away from what happened with Carly Keeney too, because I think if Kirsten deal, if, if what had happened with Kirsten deal happened and Carly Keeney didn't show up the way that she did, uh, I think the panic button would probably have been hit by a lot more people than it was. So, um, your thoughts on that? No. And it's look, and I think part of why, why it's important to take that into consideration about Kirsten deal, who should play, she should get opportunities in the postseason. She's proven it. Yeah. Yeah. But the reason why is Carly Keeney was fantastic. She was just really, really good. And I think she's a pitcher that not that she's been forgotten, but it's 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 she's been outside the top three in conference play outside of of Maxwell and May and Deal. She's just been outside the top three. She's barely pitched. And not only was she fantastic, she was she pitched nine innings and was the only only pitcher for OU th this past weekend that didn't give up a run. That's one. Two, she was fantastic in relief on Friday and Saturday. And three, she was fantastic as the starter on Sunday. She pitched 6.2 innings, only gave up four hits, no runs, struck out four batters. She just looked in control. And her splits this year in terms of whether she's coming out of the pen or as a starter are really good. They're like, they're about the same. And you usually don't see that. Right. They're really good across the board. Brian, she hasn't pitched as much. She hasn't pitched quite as much as, as may and deal or Maxwell, but in conference play, she leads the team in ERA and she leads the team in opposing batting average. She, mm -hmm. I think her ERA is like 1.5 in conference play. Her opposing batting average is like one six, nine. Like did not know that. Yeah. And and I just I just wrote a story about her at OUinsider.com. Um should but I thought it was out. you should. It was noteworthy because for one, I think she proved herself. She she was the best pitcher against the OSU team that had a lot of success against OU's other pitchers. And two, we we talked to her yesterday and I asked her like how big was that weekend just in terms of going into the postseason? And she said this was this past weekend was the closest she's felt to her old self this entire year. And for people who forget, she suffered a pinky injury that she had to have surgery on during the fall. She basically missed all of fall. And then the recovery from the surgery went right up to the start of the season. Yeah. She's been working back from that all year. She's been solid when she's pitched regardless, but considering that she's now saying she's feeling better. And then you look at her numbers at Liberty when she was really good. She was a four year starter and I think Patty even said she kind of opened our eyes in terms of what our options are. Yeah. I think you're going to see as even as early as this weekend, I, I still don't know if she's going to pitch quite as much as the, as the top three. I'm not saying that, Yeah, but I think she has to be an option. I think her versatility, I think she has to be maybe the go-to relief pitcher. Mm -hmm. And I think she's earned enough, even just this past weekend. I think she's earned a look as a starter in a game or two at least i think she has yep i, I don't think she can't just be a distant fourth option i think she has to be in the mix yeah i just do i agree yeah she is uh she's gotten to the point where i, I think as the postseason progresses i think she will become more i think she becomes more of a facet for for oklahoma um that experience plays a big role in it too i mean just her being 
she's been around the block. This, I mean, I think a lot of people forget she is, this is the same, this is the same girl that went to uh, Los Angeles, the Los Angeles regional last year and eliminated uh, UCLA. UCLA. Yeah. So like, I mean, she's been there, she's been in the big moments and that's going to help. Uh, and this, this, I, I think I, I want to re reiterate I don't know that there has been a time when the Big 12, though top heavy, um has been as good as it is right now going into the postseason. Like I I really don't think you're going to find teams out there that Oklahoma would potentially face um that are going to be better equipped to beat Oklahoma until they get to Oklahoma City. Like th those Oklahoma State and Texas are are legit. Like those are two really really good softball teams it's not it's not a coincidence that they both won series over oklahoma um so no it's not it's it's uh it's gonna be tough it's gonna be the road's gonna be tough and keeney's gonna have to play a big role before we talk um just a little bit about the big 12 tournament we should give a shout out to our our to our friends over at manscaped Hey there, beach babes. Are you ready to soak up those summer vibes and unveil your ultimate beach bod? Well, <laughs> let me tell you, you are in luck, my friends, because our friends over at Manscaped have you covered from head to toe. With the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, this ultimate all-in-one grooming kit is set to have you looking and feeling your best in the summer sun. Trust Manscaped and unlock the confidence you need to turn heads this season. Join the 10 million men worldwide who trust manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with code OU Insider. Let's make this summer your smoothest one yet. Embrace your summer bod goals with our all inclusive performance package 5.0. Perfect for those aiming for that crisp, clean, and confidence look. The updated lawnmower 5.0 ultra groin and body hair trimmer got a summer makeover. It's waterproof, designed for splashy pool parties, and beach hangouts get 20 percent off plus free shipping with the code ou insider at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off plus free shipping with the code ou insider at manscaped.com summer sun is here to say so trust manscaped to keep your pubes at bay brian big 12 tournament this week and i will say that and this is probably more of an indictment on me than anything else we're just not used to seeing OU challenged that much. And I think the big 12 tournament now, to be fair, two years ago, Oklahoma state legitimately knocked them off in the, in the championship game. But for the most part, the big 12 tournament has always just felt like kind of the precursor to the real playoffs. And OU is just going to go through and win. And that's just what they're going to do. Yep. Not only does it not feel like that this year, I'm not saying they won't win or can't win, not at any way, shape or form, but it, it doesn't feel like that this year. And two, this feels like a, bigger deal than it normally does for Oklahoma or a bigger opportunity than it does for Oklahoma who are entering as the number two seed because they lost two games to Oklahoma state. They fell from the top spot. They needed to sweep to secure the top spot. Didn't do it. They did get the win on Sunday, as you mentioned to, to stay at number two, instead of falling to number three, but Texas is one OU two OSU three. Don't know if I expect Houston or Kansas to really challenge this OU team. I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm not saying I expect that, but Brian, it feels like for OU, not that OU isn't battle tested. They are more battle tested than anybody, but I kind of feel like this is a chance like OU needs to slay some demons, I think. And Patty even kind of said that yesterday. I think they want to go on a quote unquote revenge tour, which she didn't. She said that she didn't say they're wanting to go on a revenge tour, but she said these players like going on a revenge tour is basically what she said. Yeah, this feels like like. I think it would be pretty deflating for Oklahoma to f run into OSU or Texas and lose. Oh yeah. Again, not that they can't bounce back, but I think even if they do, but I think that would feel a little deflating. And so I think for OU, this is postseason flip, flip is on. It's time to get serious. Yep. What are you looking for? Is there a key area or a general sentiment that you look for as we, we start in Oklahoma city? So the saying used to be, well, it wasn't even really a saying. It was just like a everything. Everybody shared the sentiment that, sure, you may beat Oklahoma once, but you're not going to beat them twice. Like you heard that for a few years in a row, and then Texas and Oklahoma State both did that this year. 
can one of those teams go three and one against Oklahoma? Like, I mean, think about it. You're, you're get, you get an opportunity. Oklahoma state is going to be, if Oklahoma gets through the quarterfinals, which everybody expects them to, they're going to meet Oklahoma state in that semifinal game. You're going to see Lexi Kilfoyle. You're going to see Oklahoma state's best. And then if you're able to advance in that game, you're going to see Texas's best. So the opportunity that's there, you just, you nailed it. It's, it's right there for the taking. And what I think Oklahoma needs to win those series is that, or those games is what they didn't have in the series that they lost. And that's offense. The, the offense that Oklahoma has had all of these years that they've been so dominant, it just disappeared in those series. You, you lose, you score two runs total in your losses to Texas and you scored five runs total in your losses to Oklahoma state. You gave up four total and, and, 12 in in their losses to to Oklahoma State. So um yeah, it, it's not those Oklahoma's should not be in games where they're losing uh you know 2 to 1 or 6 to 3. Oklahoma if they lose 7 to 8, so be it. Like you you scored seven runs, you did what you were supposed to. At that point you have questions about the defense, but that's the problem is Oklahoma ranks fourth in the country in fielding percentage. They don't have very many errors, which they did have some over the weekend, which was a little odd. Um, but for the most part, uh, if Oklahoma has struggled, it's been on the offensive side of the ball. So if they see that offense uptick continue and go off of the trend that we just had on, on Sunday, then they're going to be really hard to beat. And, and that's always been the case. So, um, you know, I, I still like what they've got in the circle, and and obviously the defense behind them is is incredible. It's the offense; it has to be the offense. I'm glad you mentioned that because, and I should have mentioned this earlier, but um, I think they batted under um two five zero for the weekend, and I think the first two games they were under two hundred. Yes, they were both of them. Yep. Yeah, they were they were under two hundred in both games, and against Texas, they weren't much better. Um, I right. think they were under 28 or uh, 280, I think, for the Texas series. And again, you have to give credit to Oklahoma State and Texas pitching staffs. And Oklahoma mm-hmm. State specifically, it's not just Killfoil. They've got they've got yeah. pitchers. Yeah. Um, but the problem that OU had a problem that OU had had that popped up in some games is that they were leaving runners on base. They weren't, they weren't. They're good. They are their batting average. I can't even remember what it is. It's it's high when they have runners in scoring position, but that problem had popped up a couple of times, most notably in the loss against BYU. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't the problem against Oklahoma State. They weren't getting hits against right. Oklahoma State. Yeah. So I, I'm not concerned about the pitching staff. I'm really not. I think yeah. I think the pitching staff's gonna be fine. I think they still have again some things to figure out in terms of who's starting, who's coming in relief. Mm-hmm. They've got to figure some of that out. I'm not worried about that in the defense. Yep. I am worried a little bit about the offense because Oklahoma State and Texas aren't the only ones with good pitching staffs. Nope. Think about Stanford. Think about nope. Duke. Think about Florida. Those are teams with really good pitching staffs. Yeah. So I do think again, it's not about saying OU's got to blast nine home runs and score thirty runs. That's no, not- but they need to be able to hang a five. No, and they need to be able to hang a five whenever they whenever they want. Like yeah, the five. It has to happen, especially as later you go. No, I agree. And I think the other thing too is I'm not, it's not likely, not saying it's likely. And I guess I shouldn't have blown through the quarterfinal game necessarily, even though OU handled both those teams pretty easily in the regular season. They want to, and Patty even said this it doesn't matter what their seed is in Big 12 tournament. It doesn't matter what their seed is in the regional, super regional. They just need to host their way to the World Series. Yep. If you lose or stumble, before the finals, especially in that quarterfinal, you run that they run the risk of falling outside the top eight. They absolutely do. I'm not even saying that's likely. It's not, but there is the risk. Yeah. Like it's worth talking about because it's not it's not a guarantee. It, no. It's such a deep field. Like there, there are so many teams already over the 40 win threshold. Like it, it's there's a lot of good teams this year. So yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah. So I think if you're Oklahoma, 
I mean, yeah, you're if you take care of business, you're going to be fine. Or even if you don't, uh, the chances of them liking uh, handle or getting a top eight seed is still high. But you don't want to flirt with that, right? You want to be. I think you want to be. I mean, you want to be a top eight seed, and you want to host. You don't want to add more difficulties on top of that. And not to mention the confidence issue you would go into the tournament with. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think if you're Oklahoma, this is, I mean, I think this is the chance again, really everything's going to get settled on the field strategy players coming up in clutch moments, all that stuff. But I think from a broader perspective, this is the chance for Oklahoma to establish. They are the team to beat. Yep. And I think if they were to lose unexpectedly to someone else or lose to Oklahoma state or Texas, then yeah, I don't, I think if Oklahoma loses for one, if I was a betting person, I would say Oklahoma sweeps their way through and wins. That's what I would say. Yep. However, if they don't, if they lose to Oklahoma State or Texas, Oklahoma, I, I would st- I would look at, I mean, again, like you said, they're the, they should be the favorite until their season actually ends. But I think all of a sudden you wouldn't look at them as this huge General. monster boss yeah. that everyone's got to slay. I think if you're Texas or Oklahoma State, you're not feeling that bad about right. potentially seeing them later down the road. So anyways, I don't even really like talking about all that stuff, but it does feel, this feels like a rare weekend or a rare thing where it feels like there's actually kind of a lot on the line for Oklahoma when that just hasn't been the case the last few yeah. years. Yeah. just hasn't. What? If you if you go three and one against Oklahoma, I mean, that's that's pretty decisive. That's a that's the best of five. So, um, you know, I, I just don't think, I don't think you could argue that fact. You nailed it. If if Oklahoma was to lose to one of those teams that are not necessarily the team to beat anymore, uh, just because at that point somebody's proven they can replicate their success, um, and you're probably going to see one of those teams later on down the road again. So, um, yeah, huge weekend, big weekend. I and I I before we end, I wanted to just ask real quick the comments um, on multiple occasions. Uh, she said it one time during the senior, um, during the senior day, um, events, but also in the post game that the, the stadium noise in Norman, like Love's Field is incredibly loud. She's even mentioned at the point that, you know, maybe even to the point that it's rattled the players at, at some time. You know, is that something that that's been talked about? Is there anything more on that, um, or or is that just something that's gonna get swept under the rug and we just maybe hear about it later on? I would say that this whole thing with Love's Field has been a it's been a huge transition um, for a lot of for a lot of reasons, and one of them is that they didn't get cleared for full practice activities on the field until last week, so. They have spent from March 1st, their first home game, to last week, May. They spent two months while playing their home games at Love, still practicing at Merida. And not only is the field different, because every field is different, every field has their uniquities, whatever yeah. word you want to call it. Yeah. Um, the atmosphere is just in, it's just insanely different. And if it, for anybody that hasn't been to both fields, it's just... Yeah. You can't... You, it's just different. It's just different. And... I think you couple all of that with so I don't think there's been a full comfort for OU at Love's Field and, and playing environment wise. Then I think you add the fact that there is so much pressure on this team to win a fourth title, something that's never been done in softball. The fact that they did by their standards have more lows this year than they normally than they normally do. I do think they I think they feel more pressure, not only because yeah. of the volume, there's just way more, there's du- there's more than double the fans. It's a way bigger stadium. It's the nicest college softball stadium in the country. Yep. And so almost like, I think in some ways, all of that kind of gets like, it all kind of comes together into one weird thing. And they're not saying that as an excuse. And I don't, not even, no, I'm not trying to put right. words in anybody's mouth, but Patty has talked about it enough that I do think, I think we think about home field advantage as like, a, well, the opposing teams are going to get rattled. I think if you're a team like OU with all these expectations and pressures, I think some ways accidentally that almost kind of works against you, but they're mm-hmm. not going to use that as an excuse and no one's going to feel sorry for them no, at the same, you know? Not at all. Um, so quick, quick run through. Um, 
Kansas or Houston? Kansas. I'm taking. Uh, I I took Houston only Houston. because Kansas has lost ten in a row. I, Houston, you know. Houston. Um, I I yeah. second guessed it as soon as I said it. So I so I think I think Oklahoma plays Houston. Uh, I think they take care of business against Houston. And you you said it already, uh, and I agree with you. Um, I do think Oklahoma draws even two and two against Oklahoma State on the year, and I do think that they beat o- or beat Texas to win the Big Twelve, um, and draws even there. So it's going to be fun though. This is going to be the most. This is the most anticipated Big 12 tournament from an Oklahoma perspective that I will have taken in uh, in softball in a long time. So um, it's, it's going to be fun. I look forward to it. You and I will both be there this whole weekend to cover all the events that unravel. Everybody listening, make sure to go over to OUinsider.com to read all of our coverage. Make sure to like and subscribe this OU Insider YouTube channel to get all of the video highlights that Brian will be posting there. He will have better highlights than the other outlet. He may have some of the only highlights that you'll find anywhere out there. So make sure to like and subscribe here. You won't want to miss any of that. And even outside of softball coverage, there's plenty of reasons to go over to OUinsider.com and become a VIP member. There's all kinds of football recruiting and team coverage, basketball recruiting and team coverage. Baseball is killing it right now. Um, so there's there's your, there's not anything you're not going to find over at OUinsider.com. Plus, You'll get connected into a community full of thousands of OU fans to talk about all of the news that comes in. We have you all things covered at OUinsider.com. We will be there this weekend. We will be back here next week on the Oklahoma Drill to break down everything that happens. Until then, we'll see you next time.